Welcome to the Reading Room Hangouts with uh, great authors. Today we have with us uh, John Safran, who is an author um, of, um, well, he's, I guess, first time author of a pretty amazing book that kept a lot of us reading late into a night, Murder in Mississippi. Uh, but he is known or really well known to a lot of people as an award winning documentary maker of quite provocative and hilarious. Um, programs which sort of take on race, the media, religion, and quite a few other issues. Um, I also want to extend a very warm welcome to our readers who have joined us for this uh, conversation. So we have with us uh, today um, Karen, uh, Kel, Tracy, and another Tracy. Um, now, today we're going to be talking about the, uh, the murder in Mississippi, which is really an absolutely brilliant and innovative uh, true crime story um, which in my opinion has been quite accurately compared to books like In the Cold Blood and Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil um, and that take us to places that really John has the way of taking us into these places. It's, it's quite engrossing, it's an amazing portrait of the, of the area of people, of the dead men, the murderer, um, and sort of the, I guess the additional super part of this book is the fact that we get to go on a trip with John and find out how a book like that is created, how the truth is, is found out. So before we start talking about Murder in Mississippi, in the tradition of the Reading Room Hangouts, I would like first to talk to John or ask John about uh, his reading habits. So, um, John, can you tell us what is your earliest memory of reading? Oh, my oh. earliest memory of reading? You mean being a little kitty kid? Yes. Yeah, uh, well, for, 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 I just didn't, like I read all those books my, 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 that all the kids read, I guess, like Dr. Zeus, Mr. Men. Do you mm -hmm. want to go back that early? Well, what's and, your uh, first time that you really consciously remember being sort of lost in a story? Uh, okay. Well, how about picture stories from the Bible, which uh, would would always do my head in? It was a <laughs> comic strip version of the of the Bible the, of the Old Testament, and I was just fascinated with things in it, such as Adam and Eve, the way the leaves were sort of painted on. Mm -hmm. They always cover up their kind of private parts, so simultaneously we were meant to learn that they were naked, but, you know, it kind of defeat the purpose. And I remember, like, looking at uh, Jonah lost in the whale and everything like that. For some I reason, to... that, that popped into my head when you, uh, when you said yeah. your earliest memory. And if you could become one fictional character, who yeah. would you choose and why? Oh, Don Quixote, although I already am him, really. He's a, he's a guy who thought he was chivalrous and involved in this battle for this princess, but he was really just lo loony, and, and everyone around him knows he's a lunatic and doesn't know what's really going on in, <laughs> in the real world. And, uh, yes, yeah, and I, I guess that's how I end up, you know, being, <laughs> writing a true crime book when I have no credentials whatsoever to uh, do that, or even be a documentary maker, is I, I can suspend disbelief and become Don Quixote for little bits of time and convince myself I can do these things that I kind of have no right to do. And in whose skin do you live now? What are you reading right now? I'm actually reading uh, this dude called Daniel Woodrell, and he's, it's crime fiction. And I just finished the first one out of this compilation called or Omnibus. It's called Under the Bright Lights, and it's uh, and I'm onto the second one, Muscle for the Wing. And I was in a bookshop because because I, I I awkwardly kind of if I walk past a bookshop these days, I awkwardly and I see my book in the window or in I awkwardly go in and kind of have the oh, why well, do you want me to like sign it if you think it's going to sell it? But like that, I don't always you got to be gentle because they can't send it back to the publisher for a refund once you sign it, so yeah. you don't want to kind of push them too much. But often, or actually in fact, I haven't had a bad experience. Anyway, whilst I was doing that in this bookshop in Smith Street, Melbourne, uh, I told him that I'd just read, uh, what's a No Country for Old Men by... Oh, yeah. uh, Cormac McCarthy. Uh, yeah, and I, I, I just read that because this guy 
at Penguin, one, one of the two editors who was working on my book, he ruined reading books for me, and this is how he ruined it. He told me, because he, he went through my manuscripts, and he thought I was, like, naming too many people and giving them their first name and the surname, even if they were, like, just pop up once. So there'd be, like, a, a bar, the barman, and I would have put his full name, and I was like, oh, that adds such richness and color. That's why you put it. And he said, no, 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 no. If you have sort of, like, full names all the time, it stresses out the reader in this sort of subtle way, because they're like, oh, another thing to remember. So he got rid of those. But anyway, ever since then, because I used to always just love reading nonfiction almost exclusively, and mm -hmm. ever since then, he told me that. I read nonfiction and I feel exhausted. I'm going, it's because they always put the names and the... So I, and then I thought I'll move on to fiction. So this is almost like the first time in my life I've kind of... I mean, I have read fiction before, like at different times in my life. But anyway, I went to No Country for Old Men, an excellent book and also not too many complicated names going all the way through. And then, because yeah. I liked that and it was crime fiction, I asked a dude in the shop and he said read this Daniel Woodrell because he's uh, crime fiction. And I think he's like, even though I haven't read anything on, at the back of it, it's sort of saying it's, uh, it might be in the spirit of James Elroy, LA Confidential. Even though I've, I've read James Elroy, but I read his non-fiction one about his yeah. mother's murder, but I haven't read any of his fiction. But, uh, and it's, yeah, it's all set in the Deep South because, you know, if it's not going to be a true crime in the, in the Deep South, it has to be something else in the dreams, Deep South because that's, all I've been reading and listening to in music for about the last year and a half. I went through, I've read what Flannery O'Connor, I read, uh, who's that one who did The Heart is a Lonely Hunter? Um, oh, uh, Carson, Carson McCullen, yeah. Yeah, Carson McCullers and, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird. I, just went, I went through all of them. I, I haven't done William Faulkner yet because, uh, but I'll move on to that. I've, I've, I've half read William Faulkner, but okay. yeah. Anyway, well, that, that's, that's what I read now, anything about the Deep South. Okay, well that kind of leads me, I was going to start now as into discussion of, of your book and that leads me to sort of the, the question that I wanted to start with. I really wanted to go to the very, very beginning of the murder in Mississippi uh, because I remember reading some time ago an interview with John Berant, you know, the author of Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, and he said that his story really started uh, with the fact that he wanted to write about Savannah. So he felt that it was a very sort of a special place, full of eccentrics, and it was just going to, by default, be a great story. Now your story really started when you met Richard um, Barrett and when you did that first documentary, but how did you end up sort of what prompted you to meet him and not any other white supremacist in the US or Australia or any other place in the world? Oh, that was just totally incidental. For the, if anyone doesn't know, I do documentaries that might be in the style of like Michael Moore or Sasha Baron Cohen yeah. and I needed a, a foil, I needed a white supremacist um, to prank and and the my producer or researcher just sent off a dozen emails or made phone calls to different white supremacists across America, and he just happened to be the one who got back to us, which I guess clicks into place the first thing that, uh, amongst many things, where I have this great sense of destiny with things, so I kind of feel like, oh, that happened for that reason, so now I, I definitely... So, so the, the, the fact that out of all the white supremacists in, uh, in all the land, I happen to meet up with this guy who subsequently gets murdered, kind of triggered off like I have to go back and write a book because why would destiny, why would God slash whatever fate have uh, made me hook up with Richard Barrett a year before he's murdered if I was not meant to write a true crime book? Okay, that sounds actually quite interesting. Now um, I'm going to hand off to our to our readers here. Karen, would you like to lead with a question? Yes, thank you. I have to say, race relations, watched it, loved it, most of it, uh, but you certainly <laughs> challenged me anyway, so <laughs> that's always a good thing. What so fascinates you about people like white supremacists? I'd like to forget they exist. I know that's a head in the sand thing, but what fascinates you so much about them, John? Well, I guess one level is they're sort of like archetypes for talking about more universal things and things in less dramatic ways. So they make big definite statements about how people are different. And so, and they're, I guess they're one of the few people who just come out and out and say that. So when I kind of go and 
explore these people, I, I think I get to ask questions that we all want to ask or we all should ask about ourselves but, you know, in more subtle ways like, you know, in the future are we all going to somehow meld together and, you know, get on or are we going to, you know, split up and be, and uh, keep into our little tribes or whatever and I, get, I guess that's the sort of, just because of my upbringing where I was sort of like a secular Jew but I went to a religious school and I'm in Australia and everything's, I'm kind of like an insider, you know, I'm white but I'm sort of like don't quite feel like the wasp, you know, like I'm, I'm this perpetual kind of insider, outsider all the time and I always, I, I think before I was like consciously deciding what I wanted to do in my work, I think just subconsciously that's kind of what I was teasing out and exploring and looking into. And so I think the reason I like these, you know, I like the deep south and I like, you know, all the race issues then is because there, there's kind of just a bit more kind of clarity and definiteness, if that's a word, about uh, issues of, you know, gangs and tribes and insiders and outsiders and ethnicity going on there. Mm, interesting. It is kind of black and white, isn't it? Mm. Oh, well, and I guess the other thing is, I think Australians and also basically anyone not in Mississippi or not in the Deep South, it's sort of like happy to use the archetypes in the Deep, deep South to kind of discuss these things, cause, which I guess is a bit unfair because it's basically, uh, you know, we just think, oh, the whites or at least, you know, some of the whites there, they're all yahoos and race. So we're kind of like happy to use them as our foils to kind of discuss yeah. things whilst... I've I've noticed when I try to discuss similar things in Australia, everyone just sort of tries to you know people make it more difficult for me. So you know if I say oh, you know I, I want to look at like for instance looking at white flight in Melbourne like you know like I used to I drew, I grew up in this suburb called North Baldwin, and the school was you know just basically white and then I went back there years ago and it's like you know, it, it's majority, you know, not white. It's like, well, what happened to all the white people? Is this sort of like white flight like we hear about in America where it's like people don't like living together so they nick off as soon as this other group sort of starts putting itself in there or whatever, but no one want, wants to talk, you know, everyone just hits me over the head and says, shut up, John, you mm -hmm. know, because <laughs> it's like just too awkward. So, mm -hmm. you know, so therefore I discuss that thing in the context of Mississippi and suddenly... Australians are more willing to kind of tease out those issues and look at those issues. Oh, great. Kel. Um, hey, Kel. Hi, how are you doing, John? Pleasure to meet you. Um, my question sort of ties on to that. In Murder in Mississippi, you deal a lot with community and how community changes, whether it be a community of family or an actual town or even nationality. How do you think that's stirring the pot uh, particularly in murder in Mississippi, when you just went over to Mississippi, sometimes you stirred the pot in big ways by just asking questions that everyone was dancing around and sometimes just your being there was stirring the pot. How do you think that um, benefited you in writing this book? Yeah, well, I guess th there's a lot of assumptions about, I guess, in reporting and in reportage, especially... Like, work, work, for instance, the starting point seems to be, oh, if you're an outsider, that's incredibly problematic. And if you're an outsider, you have no right to be in some, somewhere else. But I just, I just think that's not true. I, I, I think it's like there's a whole ecosystem where of writers and reporting and ways of looking at things. And as long as lots of people are doing it in different ways, I don't really have a problem with one, you know, a couple of people and me being one of them, being the outsider who kind of goes in and just by being an outsider sees things in a different way because when when you're inside something yourself you kind of get dulled to the quirky interesting things because you just see them every day, you drive past them every day and an outsider has fresh eyes and I, I think that's really helpful. I think the kind of dismissing that an outsider has no right to go into a community, e even in real, you know, problematic supposedly problematic things like a white person going into a black community, I think I just disagree. I, it's like saying, well, people inside a community should never write about it because they're always going to be biased and have an agenda. Now, clearly that's not true, but this also is not true. So, um, yep. yeah, just uh, I, I, I think by being an outsider, I just saw things with fresh eyes. In fact, 
I'm working with an American editor at the moment because we're going to be releasing the book in the United States and there's going to be some little adjustments and that's one of the things she said. She said, I was really interesting reading a book where an Australian had come in and just the kind of the things that kind of like strike him compared with, you know, even an American not in Mississippi who just sort of sees things the one way all the time. And pe people say that about, I didn't realise how mad my community was in Balaclava, Victoria, where, you know, where in my little Jewish community where I, I suddenly got the vibe that outsiders saw things in different ways and then, yeah, you start going, oh, yeah, it is a bit mad here, isn't it? I just don't see it because I'm sort of, you know, I'm in the madness myself and part of the mad and part of the madness myself. Yes. Great. That, Tracy. Did I answer your question? Or not, really? I can, I can answer it differently. It does. Way. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> Tracy. Hey, Tracy. That's the first Tracy. Yes, <laughs> Tracy from Melbourne. Oh, I can go next if you like, John. Thank you. Sure. Um, I've got a couple of questions, but I'd like to know more about Vincent. I yep. um, you might have answered the question in that the book hasn't been released in America yet. So my first question was, has he read it or did you send him a copy? Yeah, yeah, sent him a copy a couple of weeks ago. A couple of weeks ago, um, everyone, or not everyone, but you know, the main people in the book I sent them copies, and so far the I, don't, I got feedback from Jim Giles, the white supremacist, who was kind of he read something in isolation, and he was like really nitpicked at it, which I, I disagreed with him and just rolled my eyes. I don't know whether to he, he sent out a bulk email to his white supreme buddies, sort of like complaining about this section in the book, which was just. Like a weird thing, like like it wasn't this melodramatic thing. Like John the Saffron accused me of this and that, and this and that. It was about how I went to his house one time and he grabbed a DVD from Netflix out of the mailbox, <laughs> and in the book I said that he then slunk off to his after <laughs> not telling me what the DVD was. He went to his caravan or trailer and he says, "No, no, that's not what happened." He goes, "I took the DVD out, and John was there. He was the one who shouldn't have been on my property, and he's the one who left." I and Anyway, it was like this, whatever. So he, he's not happy. Ernest McBride, who's the black journalist, he likes it. Um, subject heading, murder in Mississippi is a hit, exclamation mark. <laughs> and so I guess, I guess if you're going to have either the white supremacist in your book or the black journalist like giving you an endorsement, better, go, go, better getting it from the black journalist, really. You know, there's, there's not really many sales in being able to brag that the white supremacists <laughs> like your book. So, um, and I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know when uh, Vincent will receive the book. Uh, or, or, like, yeah, it's gone to his prison cell. I also sent one to Michael Dent in his prison cell and also to the McGee family. I'm, I'm kind of more confident they'll kind of have a smooth ride there and we shall see. We shall see. And I also gave it to the, the three people the three investigators where I make it were in the book. They asked me to send them three copies, and I thought I better follow that up, or else I'll be in a Google Hangout, and I'll say, "Hang on, did you ever send the books like you said you were going to send the books in that chapter?" So, yeah, it, it will be interesting, and it'll be interesting what happens when it's it's going to be released in America late next year. This is I I still haven't worked out. I, I really should talk to someone about what I am and aren't allowed to say. Because anyway, no one's told me what I am and aren't allowed to say anymore. But yeah, it's getting released there, and it's gonna have a different title. Exciting! Oh, really? So it's gonna be like Mad Max Road Warrior, where there's like a different title for different <laughs> places. But we don't know. I don't know what the title is yet. But that's kind of, for me, that's I guess that's the the, the tangible exciting thing that's happened since the release of the book is getting an American release. So yeah, that's that's cool. Thank you. And I just wanted to ask a very small question. Sure. Um, did you ever find out what Vincent needed all of those green dots for? Well, I think uh, for luxuries in prison. I mean, I, I don't really know. To be honest, I didn't ask him because the, the, the whole thing with the green dots was a bit like weird. I didn't even know how. I, I kind of put it in the book because how could I not put it in the book? And And... Yeah. I guess the other thing that's kind of confusing to explain is once the book's out there, it looks like, well, it's so obvious. That's like you don't even think you go like, oh, John was intentionally trying to do this in that way. 
when really when I was collecting all the information and going my research, I didn't even know really what was going to end up in the book. And there were things I was actively avoiding that ended up being in the book. So, for instance, I was kind of annoyed when I was researching the book that Vincent, there was all this hang up over me, him wanting green dot cards, which is basically these kind of cash cards from Walmart. And I just thought, oh, this is an ideal because people will read the book and think, well, Vincent's not really just telling me the story because he wants to tell me the story and he, he looks less sympathetic when he's just after money. I look more predatorial or something, and even though I didn't think I was being. And then I, I just thought, this is an ideal. But then it was like, well, this is what happened. And, the st and sometimes when you leave things out of a story, they're kind of, I reckon as a reader, you know that they've been left out. And it just became, how can I not leave out, how can I leave out this whole thing of him always whining to me about green dot cards and me whining to him. And then I kind of realised... You know, it was kind of funny in in a way, in a kind of dark way. And, you, and usually, when something's funny in a dark way, like it's because it has meaning, even though you, I can't always figure out what it is. So I just kind of had to go with it. And lots of the book, uh, or at least a big chunk of the book, is about these mad phone calls between me and Vincent. And I never actually thought when I was doing that that they were like a big part of the book because I thought it was all gonna. I don't know, I, I thought I was then going to have a big interview with him where everything would happen. And so I was having these whiny conversations with him where my guard was really down, like I wasn't particularly concerned about trying to sound polite or, you know, hum or whatever. So, so, so I just had these like whiny conversations. And, and then, but then when I got back and got them all transcribed, I realised that's where the energy was. And I'm pretty good at, I don't mind throwing myself on the hand grenade for like uh, entertainment or and, and so even though I you know in one way I guess the phone calls make me look like a bit of a jerk or something maybe that um, although I you know I just thought this is the sort of this is what happened and this is where the energy is so I've kind of got to go with that. Yeah I thought it made him a little unlikable you could sort of see how it had to be in there because it, it demonstrated the relationship and how um, he was sort of, you know, making demands, and there was an, the, the negotiation for the story in, in Green Dot's currency it was quite sort of humorous um, as a reader. But yeah, as you said, he was quite whiny and demanding of you, sending you to Walmart at 11 p.m. to to buy a wedding <laughs> ring. It just seemed absolutely crazy. If it was in a movie, you just think, oh, the the writers have, have gone too far. But it carried really away. <laughs> yeah. The, um, well, that's the interesting thing about financial transactions in true crime books is people are going to complain both ways, and which is yeah, yeah, lots of people read true, true crime books because they think crime's a big problem, and so they're not they're like, how can you not me personally, but like they'd say to any author like it's just outrageous. The point of a true crime book is to show these criminals and and to teach people how to avoid. Uh, you know, being attacked by these criminals and and you sh how to keep these criminals in jail and so ha therefore how can you pay a criminal? It's just unethical. And then the other side of it is you'll have other people who read true crime books where it's where they see that it's just so, so part of the mor modern narrative that you know criminals are these in a, everyone's unfairly and unjustly in jail and you know you're an outsider who's got more power. So therefore. You should have paid him more. You're actually ripping him off because they've got some fantasy yep. in their head that the true mm. crime writer is going around with wheelbarrows of gold bullion from all the royalties he's got from the books, and then it's like, oh, you, you're the exploiter. So, yeah, that, that's kind of yep. like the, the two sides of it. In, in my mind, I thought, if I was to guess, that he, it's like he's, he's spending the money on luxuries in prison like cigarettes, and... Yeah, like I just I don't personally have a problem with even if someone had done something really wrong and they're the worst person. I, I don't really have a problem with them in prison having you know some whatever they want. You know what I mean? Not whatever they want, but like I'm not one of these people who's like, oh, I can't believe he's got a widescreen TV in prison. I'm just like, you know, as long as you know the guys in the cell, then you know, give him his cigarettes and his widescreen TV. So I, I don't. I, I'd be one of the weird things about the book is. Some of the supposed, in theory, ethical or moral problems, I didn't really have. I had them more like, oh, this is what 
someone else is going to accuse me of. So, so that's a that's a good example. I just said then I don't actually have a problem with me or some other writer providing small luxuries like whatever, like some Walmart green dot card so they can buy cigarettes or whatever in prison. So, yeah, may, maybe I just need I need to be talked around on that one. No, I think he was just very curious from the reader's perspective when he was saying. He had urgent business and, and all of these things going on on the inside. It just made me wonder, what's this yeah, urgent, well, I, you know, the urgent yeah, business? No, it's interesting you bring that up. I think it's because both him and uh, Richard and even me as Don Coyote, they had this slightly Don Coyote thing where they had this fantasy world in their heads which I'm not sure how much they knew wasn't the truth. So in Richard's case, he's a white supremacist leader and... He probably didn't 100%, even though that was that was farcical. I don't think he 100% thought he wasn't. And the same with Vincent. He, you know, he was the leader of a gang or something, or he's got this important business going on, and he's in the Vice Lords gang and all, all that stuff. When really, that, like that, both Vincent and Richard were just these two loners and these two lonely men who just weren't actually. You know, like Vincent probably saw himself, actually genuinely believed that, you know, he was on the cusp of being a sportsman. He was like a bit of a could have been champion. I, I To be honest, there were things that I can't remember whether they're in the book or not in the book, but uh, like Vincent would told, told me this story which like really touched me at the time about all these things he was on the cusp of before this bad thing happened. And... And it wasn't until like hours later hanging up the phone I just thought, oh well, it's hard for me to judge. Like, was he really on the cusp of these things before or is this just one of those, what we call in Melbourne, AFL, a could have been champion, you know, where yeah. everyone's got a story that, oh, they nearly, if only their, their leg hadn't been sort of like twisted in year seven, like they would have, you know, the they would have been yeah. there playing for Hawthorne now. So... Yeah, uh, so I, I don't think he had big business going on beyond uh, what was cigarettes. going on in his head. Yeah, and be it cigarettes. Tracy, you say in a in a book uh, that you feel like you've been tied by a long piece of elastic to Mississippi like your whole life, and it's it's taken yeah. you back there. But Mississippi wasn't really that keen on you. Um, do you yeah. think you? Oh, wait, yeah, I, I think what? Well, I think you'll, will you go there again? Like, or are you, are you kind of done with Mississippi? Oh, I'd go there to see Ernest, I guess. Like, I guess Ernest would kind of be cool to uh, see me again. And there's a couple of other people who I'd, uh, I'd see again. Mark Hutchinson or whatever, the the, the other lawyer who I, doesn't really play a big part in the book, but uh, he helped me out a lot there. And yeah, I, I'd probably... Yeah, I mean, it is a, it's a quiet place that likes to keep, where there's people like to keep to themselves, which is kind of cool. It's like the opposite of the Instagram generation, where everything has to go, you know, you have to have 83 snapshots of yourself every minute to tell everyone about. Like, there, there's this thing where people would prefer just to, you know, keep to themselves. And, yeah, I kind of respected that. And I, I'm kind of like that, believe it or not. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm I mean, sort of like ideally like to be like that myself too, but, you know. The thing, other thing that springs to mind though is when you were leaving the airport and there were those big signs are going, yeah, and we can read. And yeah. uh, you're going, oh, jeez, you know. <laughs> I, mean, I didn't mean like necessarily the Mississippians that you had something to do with personally, but the, the one, like just Mississippi as a, as a state didn't. Yeah. This character in the book, you know, didn't really seem very welcoming, or you know. Yeah, I, th I think especially for Australians, I think this whole thing about southern hospitality is kind of cool. Like they probably are friendlier than like New Yorkers or people from LA who are just squawky and yeah, and you know. Uh, but yeah, like compared to like Aussies, I, d I don't really, you know, like I felt like saying these people bragging about southern hospitality, like you know. You got if you lost your way in Adelaide, you know people would be happy to show you directions, and you know, we, you know, yeah. I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure Mississippians are like friendlier than just dudes down the street here in Melbourne, but 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 you are right. It's a, it's a very parochial place compared with the, like Melbourne, 
Like, like I started to really appreciate things from home, but I mean, it's kind of like a balance of things because you, you kind of you can be self-critical about things at home, and there's good and bad and everywhere. But uh, after spending six months there, I was kind of happy, um, you know, about th this thing we often mock that kind of like inner city culture. Because I guess a, ma ma a part of being having an inner city culture is you're kind of a bit cosmopolitan, and you just think, oh, this, my little circle isn't the only thing going on in the world. Like there are other things, and you kind of reach out for mm. things and try to look at other cultures, and and you don't really. I didn't really find that a lot in Mississippi. Like like I didn't even find people were that interested in a conversation compared with people in other places in America. Like really finding out about you know what what happens outside their borders, and mm. and it's and they're very negative about uh, like the rest of America in this way that's kind of a bit annoying. Be, yeah. Because it's it's like indulgent. It's like making out. Like for instance, everyone in New York, the only thing they do is try to keep Mississippians down. Like as opposed to, oh, they're just off. They're individuals and they're off living their lives. And, and you know, yeah. it's just they're very it's indulgent. Like, hey, I'm, I'm I'm just gonna I'm just gonna make sure my cords plug in so I suddenly don't kind of go off. Is that okay? Or have I ruined it all? The whole Google hangout. No, no, hangout? no, no. It's it's fine. Okay, it's fine. let me plug it because the the battery power is going down. Anyway, just a sec. Because I still wanted to uh, um, ask you a couple of questions. I think that uh, we still have a couple of questions for you. I know Kel does. Yes. <laughs> she does look like she, she does have a question. I'll, come, I'll definitely come back. It's a very interesting conversation. And uh, since uh, we're waiting for John, I'll just remind uh, maybe those who have uh, logged in a little bit later uh, watching us that we are talking to uh, John Safran about his uh, book called uh, Murder in Mississippi that just um, appeared here in Australia um, a couple of months ago, I believe, and uh, that John just shared with us that the book will be published in the uh, U.S. Uh, later next year. John, are you back with us? Yes, I am. Thank goodness. Okay, so I just before we go away and, and leave the uh, the question of, of characters because we've been talking a lot about Vincent and Richard, um, I, I wanted to ask you. Well, essentially, I kind of thought you know writers often refer to their characters in fiction almost like they are real people. You know, they have hard time killing them off or whatever. Yeah. Now you have written nonfiction and you actually wrote about truly real people. And um, I have been thinking a lot about your book in relation to things like the uh, like the in cold blood, and gone digging through uh, some of the um, some of the uh, things that Truman Capote said after uh, writing this book. And one of the things that he did say was that uh, he felt that he needed to exhaust emotions before he could start to sort of write. We could start work, write that that piece about the the, the characters. How do you deal with that sort of a personal feelings uh, to towards your characters, be they positive or negative? You know, do you need that distance? Were you able to sort of start writing right away? Did you change some of the the ways that you have seen them um, to sort of was the book like really reflecting you felt the moment you you saw them? How how, how did you do that? And did you well, have that issue at all? Yeah, yeah. I I guess the. Uh... One of the complicated things about when I was gathering the research was, because I didn't really know what I was doing because it was my first book and I didn't have any reference points, I, I kind of gathered the information in different ways at different times. So at the start, because I, I thought, listen, I'll write it by hand. Every night I'll write something by hand because that's what I should do. And then as I went on, I started, I started doing my heading because I started going, well, what am I meant to... And I started, then I started just blurting into this dictaphone and basically... I got months, like a hundred hours, of either phone calls or interviews or me just blurting into a dictaphone. And then when I got back home, I, it slowly dwelled on me that that was the most useful stuff because when I was blurting in the dictaphone, I kind of wasn't second guessing or thinking of things. You know, how's this going to fit into the book? I was just like blurting, blurting, blurting. And so, yeah, that, that, and that became quite a pragmatic. Uh, problem when writing the book that I had to overcome because basically for the second half of the book I had all this I had all this stuff in the form that was really helpful you know and then for the f and then for stuff at the very beginning I kind of gathered it in bits and bobs in in in, in other ways but and I, I did find that 
I, I became. It, it took me a while to to kind of start feeling comfortable, like playing around with timelines. Because I was going, what's that happen on the first day, not the third day? And especially at the very start of the book, I just got into this kind of rut of, well, you know, but I, I met Jim Giles on the second day, and that, that doesn't make sense. And you know, I just couldn't get over. I just couldn't get over somehow trying to unpack it and going, listen, even though it's non-fiction, you are allowed to kind of, you know, gather little things together. You know, like if you had three conversations with Ernest, you're allowed to put them into one and all that stuff like that. But and I, I did felt feel this obligation, like I really felt like people are going to read this, like, and I don't want to. So I tried to present people in a, in a way that I thought was uh, really human. And I, I guess the one exception to that would be the politician John Moore. He's the only one where I wrote about it, where for better or worse, I thought you know he's a politician and. For this, in that, in that kind of almost for a creative reason, for sort of you know uh, ebbs and flows, I'll write about him in a in, in a slightly like different way. But I, I mean, I, I realise that because of I don't know because of my roots and because of what people know about me, like people are just there's, a, there's an extent of people that just aren't going to accept that I'm being genuine. So for instance, I'm writing about these people in this way that I think is like really fair and. Really genuine, and I'm I'm selecting what I quote of them to because I because I just think it's more fascinating um, showing especially because lots of these people are seen as very dark either because they're a killer or they're a white supremacist or whatever, and I think it's kind of interesting creatively to kind of draw out of them the things that are kind of like the opposite of that. So suddenly you show the sympathetic side of the killer or the white supremacist. Even though I really tried that, I just realised people. Some readers are just going to read it and they're just going to go, ah, don't think a smart ass or Don's, you know, trying to, you know, present these people as wacky eccentrics. But I'd just say that they are. And I'd also say when Jim Giles, I don't, but, but, but I think I was telling you before, the white supremacist, and he was whining about how I wrote about him or whatever. And I just think, you know what, actually, you're right. As, as every author in the history of time, I did select things and not other things. But the, actually, the things I selected, Jim, was actually make you look more warm and sympathetic. If anything, I took out the side of you that's... You, I, I reckon a hundred, most of the time I take things out. It's because it's them being boring. Or And in the case of Jim Giles, I definitely took out things where... Because I just thought it was more interesting to my audience to show the kind of to accentuate the uh, the warm side or the empathetic side of him and not, not just have the other side. So if I cheated it in any way, it was cheating people to make them look like warmer, I guess. Hmm. Kel, now I know you still have some questions. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a question actually. Um, you spoke briefly just before about like the Instagram generation where you have to take photos, make everything instant. Um, one yeah. thing I noticed during the book is that it seems that everyone took everything at face value. The white supremacists, when you were there, just assumed that you were there to interview them uh, yeah. with nothing else behind it. And when um, Vincent went to jail, his family just accepted it. There wasn't any why or who or when or any of that behind it. Do you think that's a problem with um, sort of the up and coming generation where they're not putting any thought behind it? They're just this is the front. This is the. This is what I look like. This is the posturing that I'm doing, and that's all I am, without asking questions about race, about the important things that drive people. Yeah, I think so. Well, there's probably an element of that. What we touched on before, that that they're just in it all the time. So it's you know it's hard to find the woods for the trees or the trees for the woods because they're just so used to how things are. But uh, I mean, I don't know if he's quite what you're asking, but I, de I definitely felt with Vincent that he, um, yeah, he, like he he kept on trying to, he had these gambits where he was like trying to look good, for instance, and like for instance he'd post something on Facebook or he'd present himself in a way that he thought was going to be this Hail Mary pass of making him look like a winner to, you know, his wider community of friends and it was just like... It just wasn't going to happen. Like he, and like, for instance, he's in jail and he somehow thinks he can still just have some social media relationship with girls on the outside, which is going to be the same as a social media relationship you have if you're not locked in prison. And it's like, how can you be that deluded? But he kind of was. I, I, and 
but in regard to how they see things with race in America, especially young people, sorry, in Mississippi with race, is it's kind of, there was a definite huge difference between older people who'd like lived through things in the past and younger people who hadn't necessarily lived through things in the past. Like, for instance, I tried to, I was goading Justin McGee, who was Vincent McGee's brother, because he was a young person, to try to get, get sort of like his angle on all these like racially potent things like the Confederate flag. And he's just like grown up in a different time. And he sort of could just, he could like intellectually engage with things like, oh, well, the Confederate flag is sort of, you know, got this history. But he, you could tell his heart wasn't in it. He's just like grown up in a different time. And, and I mean, the other, the other interesting thing about Mississippi, it's really broken up into counties now where majority black or white. So someone like Justin McGee, he would have grown up, you know, not necessarily in white America or even white Mississippi, although he has. But another element of it is he's grown up in his black county where, you know, often the, the political leaders are black and the... Mm. And the uh, it's so... The so, yeah, so it's just complicated. So he, he's not... You can be young and black or young and white in Mississippi and not really necessarily or de definitely not feeling all the all the pains and the heat and the toxicity that you, you that you feel when you're um, part of the older generation or at least that's sort of what I, what I the impression I got but having said that like it's still it's still there in some other ways like I, I'd be talking to some young white girls and they they were still like agitated like about how Mississippi is presented to the outside world. So, like, yeah, there's definitely a bit of both, if that is what you're asking. <laughs> now, I John, I, John, I have a feeling that we could be sitting here all night talking to you. Yes. And of course, <laughs> it is so because this book is so fascinating and just have so many different angles that one could uh, take on it. Um, but I think we will have to uh, to close. And I see cool. that we have actually quite a few viewers on the on the site that are watching it as well, uh, which is great. Um, I really wanted to congratulate you going on writing such a you know fascinating book. Uh, speaking for myself, I know I'm not a huge true crime reader, but I just couldn't put this book down. And I know speaking to a lot of our right. our members and readers that it was exactly the same sentiment that that we've heard. And that, I think, is a great compliment to your story because really from a start we know what happens and yet you are able to keep the interest of people without, you know, any, it looks like quite without any effort. So uh, thank you again for joining us here. Um, no, I hope you. that uh, you will all check out our site, which is actually getting a lot of great reviews um, for this book as well, and that we will uh, see you again on our next uh, Hangout. So, uh, John, Karen, Kel, Tracy, and Tracy, thanks again. Thank you. Bye-bye.